Um, we'll also be able to ask questions through the chat, and at the end of the uh, presentation, we will go through the questions and answer all those questions that you may have for the presenter. Um, so with that, I'm going to introduce the presenter. Um, we are lucky to have today Lowy Marwa. Um, he has led quality systems and statistical applications in both IBM and Nortel networks, as well as SSHA and TSSA in the public sector. Um, as chief statistician at IBM, he led the deployment of statistical methods for improvement and control. Um, SBC design experiment sampling and reliability, key elements of a Six Sigma framework. He also led the development and ISO 9000 registration of the global quality system at Nortel Networks, formulated quality strategy at SSHA as director of corporate quality, and served on the board of directors at TSSA. In parallel, Marwa has taught applied statistics at the University of Toronto and other academic forums and conducted on-site statistics workshops in various companies and industry forums such as ASQ. Marwa represents Canada in the governing body of ISO 9001 and has chaired the development of ISO standards on statistical techniques and our customer satisfaction. And he has served on the boards of industrial and academic institutions um, such as the University of Waterloo. Um, so, Um, Lolly, are you able to um, to talk? Are you able to unmute him, Jen? Thought I did. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, Lolly, there you are. Okay, uh, great. Uh, well, thanks for the intro, Jenny, and uh, I just uh, ask you to please uh, move to the next slide uh, where you can start the presentation and lay out the agenda. <clears throat> Yeah, what we're hoping to cover uh, today is uh, a, a basic introduction to design experiments, what they're about, what we're trying to do. Uh, but the heart of the presentation is going to be a case study that illustrates essentially the, uh, a particular application, which, which in itself, itself illustrates most of the principles of uh, designed experiments. And uh, my focus is going to be on factorial designs, and again, those explained later. And we'll end with um, an, uh, an open uh, question and answer ses session. So if we could start with the presentation, the next slide. Okay, so we're looking at processes. All processes are subject to random variation. And uh, a convenient f a term that explains that, of, uh, a phrase that explains that is noise. Okay. And the outcomes of any processes are governed by, to some extent, noise, but they're primarily governed by multiple factors, and these factors can be qualitative or quantitative. And in addition to the factors that are at play in a process, we have the interactions between the factors. And the interactions actually play a very important role in uh, in the design and analysis of the data and eventually in the, in the and the implementation of uh, the findings from the experiments. Okay. So let's go to the next slide. We're talking about interactions. Okay. These, this phrase refers to the relationship between factors. In other words, a, a factor in a particular state may have, uh, an, may have an effect on the process that will depend actually on the setting of another factor. And this is a relationship between uh, two factors that affect the outcome is conveniently referred to as an interaction. Now, the interactions are typically unknown. 
at least that's been my experience in most experiments we run, uh, even in so-called mature processes, we have difficulty identifying uh, the interactions between factors. And, and the interaction is actually quite important because it allows us uh, to have a better forecast eventually of the process outcome. And th but the main benefit is really that they often are a, a, a clue uh, to give you insight into the cause of process behavior. And ultimately, they're key to a robust solution uh, for whatever, whatever it is that we're examining. Okay. So if you could go to the next slide. So when we start investigating a process, okay, our goal is twofold, okay, to understand the effect of the, each of the factors that we've identified in the process, and we label them community like A, B, C, D, et cetera, and the effect of the interactions that may exist between these various factors, A, B, C, D, et cetera. Okay. And the most effective approach we have um, to examining uh, factors and the interactions is actually designed experiments. And the, 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 the rigor in design, in design experiments allows us to differentiate true effects that are due to factors from the general noise that surrounds all of all processes. And if you're looking for efficiency, the most uh, one of the most efficient um, approaches to experiments are, are so-called two-level factorial experiments. Okay? And this is what I'm going to be focusing on in this presentation. And these are better explained uh, in the next slide. Okay? So this is what a typical factorial design looks like. Okay? It looks like a matrix with plus and minus signs. Uh, the, each of the signs there refers to two possible settings for any factor. So if you have, for instance, a factor A, um, you know, it, 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 we will assign it two particular levels, and this is again going to be illustrated later. But for instance, if A re represents temperature, then we can, we can choose to assign, say, a minus sign to refer to a temperature of 15 degrees and a plus sign to refer to a temperature of, of 30 degrees. Um, the, the choice of the label, a, mi a minus a plus, is really quite arbitrary. It doesn't matter uh, which is applied to, to, uh, to which setting, as long as you retain that, that, uh, that identity right through the exercise. So going on to the next slide, we have uh, a typical factorial design. Okay? We have factors A, B, C, and D. And these are assigned to matrix columns. Each row, when you read it horizontally across uh, the matrix, each row represents then an experiment trial or what we call a run. And for example, the settings for the first trial would be just looking at, looking at, at that particular matrix, A minus, B minus, C minus, D minus. It's a very convenient shorthand or describing a particular settings for for a, uh, an experiment, okay? and these these eight trials constitute a, a, a factorial design of eight trials, and they allow you to basically uh, understand the effect of uh, each of the factors A, B, C, D, as as well as the relationship between the factors that may or not exist. Okay? So we'll go on to look at the next uh, slide where we explore this further. So the, the, at, the, the, at the end of each run, we record uh, the result of the, the, the particular run. Uh, we refer to, refer to that as the response. So the result of each trial is a response, and the analysis of the responses will allow us to determine or estimate the main effect of each factor. By the main effect, we mean the effect of the factor independent of all other factors and inter in interactions. And uh, it also allows you to assess uh, the effect of two factor interactions if any, any interactions exist. And once again, we typically do not know, uh, although we can try and guess, but we typically don't know really what the, which interactions are at work. And this is probably best illustrated. <coughs> if you can move on to the next slide, 
is a, a case study, and I think the case study is uh, is an is one that we've used. I've used uh, to uh, uh, to illustrate uh, many of the, the 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 strengths and the and the potential of designed experiments. Okay. This case study, if you could move to the next slide, took uh, was conducted in IBM, okay. and it was in a circuit board manufacturing process, and where we detected a certain uh, type of defect was detected, in fact, by one of our clients. You know? And we, we, when we examined the defect, we, they look like little soda balls, which is on the, the picture on the left-hand side of the screen. And they look like, like tiny little balls of, uh, of solder, as you can see between uh, two, uh, two uh, components on a board. Okay. And when we examined this particular uh, uh, defect, we found another defect. And we called it solder on gold because this looked like the same solder paste that is smeared onto the gold. Okay. So we chose to call it. And again, we didn't really know what it was or what was happening, but uh, we called it solder on gold because that's, that's what it looked like. So we, with, the, with these two uh, defects in mind, um, we had to conduct an experiment to determine what might be causing these defects. So the first stage in this exercise is spelled out in the next page. Okay. Um, we looked at the, essentially the, the total uh, uh, process. Okay. And again, each process is unique, and I won't go into the details of uh, this particular one, but we need to understand that in this case, we chalk the main steps in this process, which is included preparing the, 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 the card. Uh, then we screened the paste on the card. Um, the component was placed on the card. Uh, it went through an oven where, where the sort of was reflowed. Then it's going to clean and then inspect. And, uh, and then, and the defects that we were looking for, we would basically check for at the end of the process in at the inspection stage. So, and this is an important step. The first step in this process was a brainstorming session and to determine what possible causes, um, uh, what possible factors might cause uh, this, uh, this condition, or okay? uh, condition in this case being the defects. Okay? And it is important that we, we we bring in everyone into this exercise. We consult with the managers, the engineers, the operators, and the inspectors. In, in other words, anyone that had kind of a, a engagement with the process, because each person brings uh, to uh, their study their own particular observations, which which are which, are, which all is unique, you know. And after considerable uh, discussion and examination, we uh, settled on eight possible factors that might result in in, in this defect. And the, those eight factors are examined in the page that follows. Okay. If you can move to the next slide. Yeah. So these are the potential factors that we found in this experiment. And again, I won't dwell too much on these individual factors because they are unique to that to that particular process. But I'm going to discuss them only in the context of uh, the value of how to use this information in conducting, in designing, and conducting an experiment. Okay. So just to run through the process, uh, the factors. You know, they, they were both qualitative and quantitative. In other words, um, for instance, um, in the washing uh, the panel okay, was one factor, and it was either a yes no condition. Okay, we said maybe the the fact of washing it or not washing it has a bearing and causes a defect. We didn't really know. Or to move to the last, uh, for instance, um, uh, factor, the type of oven we were using. Uh, there were two different manufacturers, and we weren't quite sure whether the difference was associated with the individual type of uh, oven. Uh, again, another qualitative factor was the, the heat profile for these ovens. Okay, uh, you could call it steep or slow. We, we chose to simply label them cold and hot. Okay, 
Um, other factors like the space between the the boards as an event through the process. Uh, sometimes it was the other, another factor was the height of the paste when we screened it on. So again, the, the intent is not really to discuss the individual uh, factors because um, every pro process that we investigate will have a different set of factors. But just to illustrate that really the factors can be expressed in, in qualitative terms, like cold or hot, A or B, or can be quantitative, where we basically have a measure like uh, the offset being either zero, which is uh, factor number C, uh, could be zero or maybe 10, 10 mil, uh, the paste height of nine mil or 12 mil and so on. So with these factors, uh, once they were identified, we basically entered them into a factorial design. And that's on the next page. Okay. In this case, we used a 16 trial experiment. Okay. If you, that's, if you look at the matrix, uh, the trials are numbered from one to 16. They're each, and each trial, uh, the settings that uh, the, it implies a, a running a process of those settings where uh, the settings for A, B, C, D, all the way up to, to the age factor up to age are determined by the, the, the sign in that matrix. So for instance, in the first trial, it just so happens that all the factors selected will run, the process is run with all of them at the negative level. Again, the word negative minus sign is simply a, a, a convenient label. Uh, if you look at the next uh, trial, trial number two, the the levels change. Uh, a, a is now at the plus cell level, B is still minus, C is minus, and so on. So in other words, each the settings for each trial are unique. Okay? And the location of the matrix and uh, the location of the of the factors, A, B, C, et cetera, in the matrix are quite are important because they determine uh, the clarity of the information that we will eventually receive uh, in the experiment. Okay. And, the, and the purpose of this particular design um, with those, with those uh, the, with the factors and those uh, assigned in, in those columns in the matrix, that will will result uh, will reveal the main effect of each factor and the interaction effects if any exist now in this case when we talk about the main effect we mean the effect of a factor independent of all other factors independent of all other conditions and independent of all other interactions the pure effect of the factor okay, so that's that's what we mean by the main effect and the interaction effects, obviously, as a, as the word implies, is the is the effect of any particular combination of factors. So that said, uh, we uh, conducted the run experiment and we recorded against each run the defects found. Okay. So if you could move to the next slide, slide. Okay. So this is a, a slide that basically spells. Uh, out the really the, the the settings for each particular trial of the, each of the sixteen trials, and what we found, what we recorded as a as a result uh, with those combination of, of factors. The first trial, for instance, yielded one hundred and fifty four uh, defects. Uh, the second one had a, a substantially more, and so on, all the way down. Okay. So the the what does uh, the data allows to do is to determine the, the, the magnitude of the effect of each factor and the interaction effects. And again, it's too much. Uh, there's, we won't go into the detail of how these the, 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 the effects are computed because that would be a separate uh, undertaking. <laughs> but the question that at the end of the day was how significant are these, uh, these effects? Is this coming from the fa from the factors, or is it just noise in the process? So the here we have to go to the next slide to discuss the analysis of the data. Now, some of you who've 
who've, who've uh, studied uh, statistics, you know, are very familiar with the numerical analysis of the data using a technique called ANOVA analysis of variance. And this is, apart from its complexity, it requires replicate, meaning you need to repeat everything at least uh, twice and more uh, in order to be able to determine um, the significance of, of, the, of, the, of the effect. Um, if, you can't, if you don't have replicates, then you have to have some sort of a prior estimate of, uh, of what they call the error. Okay? Um, in this case, we have favored graphical analysis for reasons that will be evident soon. The graphical analysis is effective. It's easy to interpret and communicate the findings that, when you, when you, that you get. Uh, it's incidentally quite consistent with numerical analysis. And in some cases, for unreplicated experiments, it's in fact the only option you have. So I'll, I'll illustrate what we're saying here with uh, the next slide, which is a graphical analysis of the defects. OK. Now, you, what you see here, the red dots here refer to the what they call the effects for each of the 15 columns in that 16-trial uh, matrix. Okay? If you notice that the matrix had 16 runs, and, and but the columns of the matrix, uh, are, there are 15 columns, and there are 15 effects. Each of the columns in the in the matrix um, uh, yields uh, um, an effect, and the magnitude of the effects are, is the other are laid out in um, in uh, descending order, and then plotted on a probability plot. This is a, a, a particular kind of graph paper, a normal probability paper, and its value, its utility here is readily explained um, in, by the two points below, okay, which is that. If you have a group, a group of data points in a, on a normal probability plot that fall in a straight line, that th these readings correspond to inherent variation. In other words, it's normally distributed. This is noise. In other words, this represents no normal variation in a process if you did nothing else at all. Okay? The outliers, which are the ones that are highlighted in yellow, D, the, the interaction. C, D, and C, okay? these are deemed to be significant. Now, they are visually significant, but I can, as an aside, I can tell you that the mathematical analysis also confirms these, slide, these data points to be statistically significant. So now we'll stay with the graphical analysis. So let's look at the analysis now. Again, uh, next slide. So the significant effects from that uh, analysis of that data were the, the factors that we've given on the side here, which is C, which is registration offset, uh, D, face height, the CD interaction, and the preheat profile. And the recommended action based on the on the analysis was to run C, D, and G all at the, at the low level. Okay. The immediate result when we when we ran the process at, at those settings was an over over 80 percent reduction in defects now that looks very good but we still uh, a far it's a far cry from zero okay so we began to investigate uh, the causes of that the root cause for this the next slide is, is addresses the root cause okay. so the root cause it was uh, is, is really the clue to that was a CD interaction, the interaction of the two factors. And again, I, I, we won't go into the details or the technical details of why we or how we came to that, but uh, I, I've tried to convey that information in a graph, in a graph, uh, in a picture, pictorial form rather, by showing that the the, the offset on the paste was, was a major factor. That uh, when the paste was not on the gold tab, which which was the ideal setting, the 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 spillover would cause um, would cause defects. Okay, and the robust solution really was to, to avoid the spillover was to shrink the foot the footprint for the, of the paste. And when we shrank the footprint, okay, the the result was immediately was zero. Okay, so. 
here the the CD interaction okay, was really a clue to the root cause of the problem. Okay, and and it it, it illustrates the importance of basically trying to understand and capture the interactions because and and it also illustrates the point that that very often even in mature process which this one was incidentally uh, the the engineers were not aware of the of the of the uh, the, the interaction until we until we ran this experiment okay. so to move to the next slide that took care of one type of defect the second category of defect was even more interesting okay that was a defect that we call solder and gold. Okay. So again, the next slide shows the same experiment that we ran. If you just move on, the same experiment, but now we have recorded uh, in the same experiment, we made a separation of the types of defects that we were finding. This is the second category of defect, which was solder and gold. And the first uh, trial, we found four defects. Next one was nine and so on all the way down to the last slide 16 that had one at eight and so this was your experiment response when we did the number crunching on that and if you can move to the next slide that that was what was a real surprise we plotted them on the same novel, normal probability plot paper and they all conform to a more or less a reasonably good straight line fit that implied that none of the factors, none of the factors that we're looking at were significant statistically, that this was all noise. And so this was baffling because if they're not significant, then, then it means that the, the true cause, the factors that cause it, lie outside the domain of the experiment. And what do we mean by the domain of the experiment? Well, look at the next slide, Kim. Okay? The, in the case study here, this is the same flowchart that we saw earlier. That it, it represents essentially what we call the, the domain of the experiment, meaning this is the scope of the, this is the range of stuff that we looked at. Okay. And if it's not there, then the only other place it could possibly be is beyond that, which is at incoming material. So we put a flag on incoming material. And we found the so-called solder and gold defects in the incoming material. And the problem was that it was not actually, go, uh, it is simply defective gold plating, but nickel exposed. Uh, so it was a very weak, a very thin, plate, uh, thin layer of gold plating. And so the nickel was exposed and it visually resembled solid defects. Okay? And because we were conditioned and we were, we were focusing on looking for solid defects, um, we, we, this bias was reflected even in, in, in the label that we used for describing this defect. Turns out it was a supplier problem. It had nothing to do uh, with, the, uh, with the manufacturing process. So this is a real sort of uh, learning. Uh, if we move to the next slide, if we have to summarize what this exercise taught us, it was that we could we learned to identify the significant factors and the interaction. We also identified factors that are not significant, and this is in engineering terms or in any uh, practical context is 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 equally important information. And this led us to the true cause. And the fact that certain factors are not significant has another has another bearing has another significance. It allows us to adopt cost-effective options. So if there are two settings for a factor, a factor, let's say temperature of say low or high, uh, if low means um, that it's cheaper to run the process, then we would go go with the lower setting. So in other words, the, the, the information that this, this experiment yielded, you know, was useful. You know, even when, the, when there were no significant factors found, the fact that a factor was, had no bearing on the process is in itself very useful information. The third thing to note about this was that is the efficiency of this entire undertaking. Okay. Uh, we were able to, in the same experiment, okay, by simply recording different um, types of defects, we were able to 
uh, evaluate multiple factors, multiple responses simultaneously. So this is uh, extremely useful because if it's in th that we were able to evaluate a process with 16 runs, uh, looking at two different types of defects and, and, uh, and a mixture of uh, quantitative and qualitative uh, factors, and come up with the, with, the, with the, 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 an understanding of the problem and a solution to the problem. Okay. So moving to the to a more general discussion now. If you can move to the next slide, okay. So we've used this. The case study has been really used as a, as a as a as an example to illustrate a factorial experiment, a factorial design. Okay. And this and the question then comes up of design, in designing an experiment, uh, how do you design it or how do you choose the design? Uh, the families of factorial designs. And we can examine those families and look at the possible applications okay, of uh, these designs. Okay. So let's look at the question of what they call design resolution, okay, the clarity of information. If you can move to the next slide, okay. The the, the phrase that we use in in, in design experiments is, uh, which is design resolution. It neatly describes the clarity of information that you can obtain from any particular design. Okay. So when you're looking at factorial designs, and in fact this applies to other types of experiments too, okay, it, we, let's look at three main kind of categories of experiment designs. Okay. Resolution three. This is the lowest uh, category of uh, of experiment design in terms of the, it has very low clarity. Okay? And in this design, your main effects, the main factor effects are confounded with interactions. That confounded means that they, they are, they're mixed up with the interactions, which obviously is not as clear as if you didn't have the interactions there. It has very low clarity, but at least the, it has, it's cheap. Okay, it, it involves the least number of trials, and the only reason you would consider it would be that you that that's all that you can afford. Okay. Another category of design is the resolution four, okay, which is where the main effects are clear, but your interactions are confronted with other interactions. This is not, not too bad because normally, if you have a bunch of interactions mixed up with, with with each other, you can you can probably pick you can guess at which one of the the, the the two or three might be active. And it's a good compromise between clarity and cost, okay? Because to run a resolution five design, which is the one below okay, on this page, where all main effects are clear, all interactions are clear. Yeah, it's excellent, but it, it is very expensive. Okay, um, uh, I, I could add as a footnote here that I've never had the luxury of running a re resolution five uh, experiment. You know? I think most experiments in practice are res resolution three and resolution four, and and res for for all practical purposes. I, I think resolution four designs uh, are pretty good, and that, that they serve the need moderately well. Okay. So uh, I recognize this is a limitation of a presentation of this nature is that there's no interaction with with the audience, and I and I beg your patience here, and that uh, hopefully we can you, you have some questions that we can address after after the presentation. But for now, let's move on to the next slide, which looks at Uh, these families of factorial designs, okay, and I've chosen to basically group them into certain under certain uh, labels. Okay, the standard order designs, what I'm calling standard order designs, are derived from matrices in the established literature, 
and the, and the alias structure of you know, the factor of facts and interactions are mathematically derived. Okay? These designs ca capture a full range of experiments. Okay? The eight, 16, 32, in fact, it's two to the K, where K can be any number. Uh, of the, this, these are designs that are called two to the K trial designs. And they can, each of these designs can accommodate uh, 7, 15, 31 factors respectively. Okay? They have the widest application uh, in industrial practice. Okay? And, and in picking a design, you basically pick the highest resolution design that you can afford. Uh, you know, with the resources that you have. Okay. And by far, this actually is pretty much accounts for most um, uh, factorial experiments in, in the literature. Okay. The next category of design is the next page. These are what look at first to be even more uh, efficient designs. They refer to packet Berman designs. Okay? And these are unique designs for the, the number of trials that we've shown below. They can, you can use them for 12 trial trials, 20, 24, 28, 36. Okay? And each of these trials can accommodate up to T minus one. In other words, the 12 trial design can take up to 11 factors 20, uh, the 2012 design can take up to 19 factors and so on. Clearly, they are very efficient. They have one big res one big limitation, which is that they all design resolution three, which means that all main effects are confounded with interactions. Okay. In fact, the interaction uh, uh, structure in in plaquette Berman designs is very complex that every column in this design, every factor in this design is confounded by a fraction of every possible interaction that might, that could exist. Okay. So in a sense, only your large effects are visible because there's a lot of, the, the, the results are clouded by a lot of noise. Okay. But the advantage is that they're very useful for screening experiments. Uh, they were, in fact, uh, developed, um, uh, they are the most recent designs in the sense that they were developed uh, uh, during the last war uh, as a way of uh, accelerating um, development of, uh, of, uh, of products. You know? And where, where they were only looking for large effects okay, uh, to get a rough idea of which way to go. So again, this is very attractive, very useful, but the limitation is that that uh, they're not very precise in the information you get. Okay. Moving to the next slide, there's some other. Um, there are whole, the whole spectrum of other special designs. Okay, and I won't go into them uh, in this presentation. You know, the three quarter fractional factorial, so three level designs, mixed level designs. But they are they are really for very unique situations, and so they're beyond the scope of our immediate interest. Okay. If I had to summarize, I would say that the most widely used designs are the two-level factorial designs, and within those two-level designs, there's the there's the Plaquemurian designs for screening, and the standard order designs, which are really the most versatile. Okay. So I could take us, in a sense, to uh, the next uh, page. We're looking at the scope, okay? Uh, the scope of des design experiments is actually much wider than most people recognize, okay? First of all, the factors that you are examining they can be quantitative, like measurable factors, like temperature, speed, density, etc. Or the factors can be purely qualitative, type of material. Is it soft or hard? Like, you know, in, in trying to decide what kind of, a, of a factor you can introduce, it doesn't matter if you can't quantify it. You know, a qualitative label will do just as well. Okay. 
The second and equally important point is that they can accommodate the metrics involved in terms of the responses from the experiment. They can be quantitative, like you're measuring tensile strength, bacteria count in, in, in say, hospitals and so on. Or they can be qualitative. For instance, you can use the experiments to determine the quality of, let's say, paint finish. How do you determine it? You just say, okay, I think this rates from on a rating from one to ten. You know, I'll give it an eight or seven. Like even a rough uh, gauge as a response will work. Okay? Other applications are, for instance, in taste. Um, they've used extensively in the in the food industry. Okay? Um, they, they, these are rating schemes, you know, there are various rating schemes that, that allow allow easy measures. Okay? So the factors and the metrics can be both qualitative and quantitative. They, you can have a combination of both. And finally, the application of design experiments. They've, they've, the wide application is obviously in, in the production side. Okay? But really, they are applicable to all stages: research, development, production, service, the whole works. You know. Also, the sectors in which these experiments are applicable. The the obvious applications are in science and technology. There's also agriculture. There's medicine. There's software, service. I mean, there's a, the list is endless. It's, it's in fact infinite. Okay. And this really captures the full scope of the application of the potential application of uh, design experiments. Uh, they remain uh, among the most um, useful tools there is in the, the in the range of very uh, range of uh, I mean, uh, as they they don't cover um, uh, the same. Uh, they're, they're not to, there's not to say that other tools are not as useful. They, each tool has an application in the context. But these have, have been found to be the most versatile of all tools. And I, I quote a personal experience here. Okay. So essentially, um, it, this really constitutes more or less the end of the presentation. But I'll just sort of, as a postscript, add that this uh, was extensively taught. And the next page captures um, essentially the material. Okay. The, this was taught as a, as a, as a series of courses. Um, Initially, in, within IBM and, and within the ASQ as well, uh, but also um, taught at the University of Toronto. Toronto okay, and, and so th this is just a way of background in the sense that this is not um, something that is um, uh, unique to any particular corporation or any particular university. I, I'm simply listing what actually has been done. Okay? And, and the focus of these courses has been primarily on standard order designs and placket bone designs, okay? because they cover the widest range of, of uh, applications. Okay? So I think we're in good shape here to move on to the next slide, which is really to leave it open for uh, questions and uh, discussion. Okay? And we've left uh, a significant um, a chunk of time here for discussion because we recognize that that uh, in a situation like this where we don't have the opportunity to have raised questions in the middle of the presentation, I'd welcome any questions you may have, and we'll, we'll do our best to address them uh, in this forum. Well, thank you very much, Lolly. Uh, it's Gary Gehring here, the Chair of Statistics Division for this year. I uh, want to thank uh, Lolly for your presentation, uh, thought-provoking, I thought. and. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Jen for uh, hosting this for us. I do have some questions that came in. So uh, I'll start here. I guess one was uh, probably very simple, but on your uh, matrix, uh, some of the column headings were empty. And, and what's the meaning or why are some empty and some have letters? Was there any thought to why they were in particular? Uh, columns. Okay, uh, good observation. Um, the, the, the location of the factors of those columns is actually uh, critically uh, determined by the mathematics. Okay, the, the so-called blank columns uh, are actually columns that measure interactions, and so typically they would have multiple interactions in there, depending upon where which particular column you're talking about. 
uh, there, there isn't the time uh, here to basically to have shown that detail. Okay, but each of the every column on, on the design has plays a plays a role in the both the design and the analysis. So the short answer to the blank columns is that they typically contain uh, uh, multiple interactions. Great, thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, next question here was, uh, is this a two by eight dash four fractional design question mark? And what is the logic for grouping the factors together? Well, you, you talk about, uh, I think you referred to the 16 trial experiment. Uh, maybe, yeah. That, I'm just I, trying. To, that's what the question yeah, I, is. So. Yeah. No. I, this is yes. This is, I've tried to stay away from. Okay. I I recognize uh, the labeling. Okay. Uh, it is yes. These are fractional factorial designs. Okay. Um, the one the one that I in the case study was a fractional factorial design, and and it was indeed uh, two to the power of four minus one. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, were the two responses treated as standard variables uh, in brackets using the normal distribution or as count variables using the Poisson or similar? Okay, in this case, uh, the the responses uh, as defects uh, follow a classic uh, Poisson distribution. But the type of distribution doesn't really matter. We, we're treating it as um, uh, we would still use the normal probability plot paper for the analysis because the the analysis the probability paper would basically basically identify what what um, how much of the data is in fact explained by by normal uh, distribution, which means noise, and how much of it is not. Okay, so the the probability paper identifies, or the plot problem on the probability paper identifies those, um, uh, not the responses, but the computation from the responses, the effects, that those that are due to uh, noise and those that are not due to noise, which means they are something else. And by definition, uh, these are then significant effects. Okay. Thank you. Uh, another one here. Uh, in a design of an experiment with seven factors, what DOE is more robust? Plackett Berman or Taguchi Ortho Gonal Array? Okay. Um, uh, the short answer is Plackett Berman. Uh, Taguchi's designs are actually um, uh, the same. This is the, <clears throat> the for instance, that his, Taguchi's 12 trial design is actually is actually a Black and Berman design. Okay, it was the long before. Okay. Uh. Um, Taguchi's other designs are simply applications of um, of existing orthogonal arrays. Uh, what's unique about his designs is the choice, the way he chooses to uh, assign the factors in the design, and 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 I and I have a separate paper that basically sort of examines the limitations of that approach. Uh, the there's some confusion around the label to Gucci because really the designs are factorial frac fractional factorials. They, they are they've been around for for, for ages. Okay, uh, and the applications as he uh, that that uh, attributed to the are in fact uh, uh, typically result in lower resolution design than what's what's in fact normally possible. Okay? So in fact, a standard uh, order design gives you better information than uh, say around eight trials or twelve or sixteen trials or twenty or thirty-two trials gives you more clear information than to which you designs of the same number. But I can if if there if there's interest, I can send a paper. Uh, that um, that explains that. Okay, there have been several papers that have explained that try to correct this misimpre misimpression that it's something unique in their design, but in fact the unique dimensions are in fact the weak dimensions. No? Okay. Yeah, and I see uh, at the bottom of your last uh, 
uh, slide that you do have your email there, and so you would welcome any questions or requests for other information would be fine. Well, I'd be glad to make, uh, uh, leave it posted on the ASQ website if you, if you think that that would reach a bigger audience, whichever you prefer. Yeah, no, that's fine. I think it'll just, while well, we'll record, uh, this recording will be posted to the Statistics Division YouTube channel. And mm -hmm. uh, also, if uh, anyone uh, is wanting copies, they can uh, probably, of your presentation today, well, I think Jenny's going to make it available, or at least it'll be available to uh, email out to requests. I'm not sure how she's going to handle that just yet, but we'll sort it out before we're done. I do have, uh, I think, another question here that we could look at. It ties in with your uh, factors piece. So how were the qualitative input factors handled as uh, simply a zero one numerical value or something else? Uh, you can you can call it a zero one. A zero one uh, is used in some textbooks, for instance. They start with minus a plus. But the, the, regardless of which particular convention you use, it really is the same. So if it's a qualitative factor, uh, and in fact in this uh, in the case study that we examined, uh, there were some qualitative factors. Uh, for instance, when you said um, uh, you either have uh, uh, a cleaning or no cleaning. I don't know if you would call that a qualitative factor, but that's simply minus a plus, you know. Or if, we, if you're using uh, two types of ovens, you want to say which one is, um, is uh, you won't understand the difference between the two, you label one minus and you label the other one plus. Uh, if there's a particular type of qualitative, qualitative factor the person is uh, the question is coming from, then I'd be glad to consider it, but, but it, all qualitative factors are treated the same way. You would label them one or the other, minus or plus, a zero or one. Okay. Uh, I have another question here. Uh, in design of experiment, it is always recommended to make the randomization and replication. In the case study, did you apply this? We could, yes, uh, we did the randomization. So I showed the 16 trials, for instance, uh, in this experiment, and the 16 trials were run in random order. Okay. Um, but the replication wasn't possible because it would mean, replication literally means re you re replicate the entire experiment, and so you have, against each run now, you have two, two uh, uh, possible readings. Okay. Uh, the sheer the sheer cost of replication made this impossible, okay? and so we basically had to. Uh, and in many cases, replication isn't possible at all. Okay, um, so be, so th th that is uh, is actually one of the reasons why graphical analysis is uh, is one that are favored because it doesn't depend, okay, on um, it's a solution. That becomes available when there's when there when there is no replication. Replication is important for ANOVA for the numerical analysis called ANOVA. But if you don't have the resources to do that, or if it's, uh, the na sheer nature of the, of the exercise precludes uh, replication, then you have to basically live without it. Excellent. Thanks for that explanation, Lolly. Uh, another question, I was wondering how the normal probability plot accounts for experimental error. Okay, um, the lo logic behind this is really very, very simple. Um, and, and, and the use of probability plot, by the way, was pioneered by uh, LS Art at, uh, at Rutgers uh, many years ago, okay? And, uh, Rutgers has written uh, several books on the subject, um, and I'd be glad to sort of send in information on those books. But uh, the logic is very simple. If you have uh, a noise, noise by definition is random, and therefore normally distributed. And uh, so the using this logic, uh, by plotting the data on a probability plot, the noise elements will will conform to a straight line. 
and the sickness of sex will appear as outliers. And that's, it's, it's a very, very logical application of, of, uh, of uh, theory. So I, I don't know if that answers the question, but uh, uh, if there's more information that you need, I'd be glad to, to continue. Okay. Uh, I think we're getting close to the end here. I think there's uh, time for one more. Let me just see what else we have. Uh, <clears throat> what formula for sample size and design of experiment provides more accuracy on the results? Okay, the question of sample size is probably the one that most statisticians have, uh, get in, in almost every context. Um, in the in the in the course that I, that I taught, the, the, there there are in fact um, uh, tables and formulae that basically uh, advocate uh, the sample size or the computer sample size uh, based on the, the 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 risks that you're prepared to take. Okay, the alpha beta risks and so on, and one can do that. Okay, and and there's information available. Um, it's part of my standard kind of course uh, course notes. You know, yep. The, but the more practical answer is really um, the sample size. Typically, in most cases, is what you can afford. Okay, you take the biggest sample that you can afford to, uh, to run an experiment, and that's that's a very practical, pragmatic. Kind of uh, approach that most uh, uh, staff people have used. Excellent. Yeah, cost is always a factor with uh, pretty much anything to do with uh, yes. design yes. of experiments and samples, etc. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I think that's. Uh, I'm going to call it here. Uh, we got through the the bulk of the questions, and again, I'd like to. Give uh, our thanks to Lally Marwa for uh, spending some time with us today on this uh, designed experiments presentation. I found it very uh, interesting and useful. I'm just going to turn this over to Jenny, who will uh, handle the last few uh, components. There is, a, I think, in the chat window, we were going to put a link to the uh, ASQ statistics division. Uh, home page on my ASQ. There's a, a public portion if you're not a member and you can uh, take a look at some of the things we're doing and we will be trying to post all our uh, future webinars there as well as uh, send it out through uh, our other uh, medias. Uh, Jen, I'll just pass it over to you. Thanks, Lolly. Thank you. Um, again, thanks to Lolly for the great presentation. Um, you'll be getting an email from me with your um, your credit for the webinar, um, and then we'll be posting all the uh, information on either the My, My ASQ Statistics Division webpage or the uh, YouTube channel. Um, and the division webpage will have all our future um, webinars as they come up if you want to monitor that page. So I appreciate you joining us today. and. Hope to see you in a future webinar. Thank you.